to think that I have a pretty good handle on my jokes and witticisms. I did take a class about it. Over a year ago, I took a linguistic anthropology class called Speech, Play, and Verbal Art. It was essentially a course about jokes and how people implement them in various cultures and languages. So at the end of the term, so it goes, I was tasked with writing a term paper, a pretty lengthy one. And I had to figure out something that was new, that we hadn't covered in class before, and that I was passionate enough about to write a 20-page report. So at, at a loss, in search of inspiration, I texted my younger brother, because 16-year-olds know what's funny, right? So I texted him and I asked, what do you and your friends find funny? Internet memes. So if you're laughing, which thank you, you might already know what an internet meme is and even have personal experience creating or enjoying them. But what you might not know is that there's a distinct difference between cultural memes and the internet memes that many of us are familiar with. To explore this, let's journey back in time to before the World Wide Web was even in common use. The Encyclopedia Britannica defines a meme as a unit of cultural information spread by imitation. And in 1976, Evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins coined this term meme in a novel about evolutionary genetics. What do memes have to do with evolutionary genetics? Well, meme is a word. Oh, that's Richard Dawkins, by the way. <laughs> meme is a word which models itself after the word gene and is a shortened version of my meme, the ancient Greek term for imitated thing. Dawkins argued that memes, or cultural ideas, spread throughout generations in the same way that genes do. For instance, a biological trait like brown hair passes from parent to child, so does cultural information. Like my dad taught me how to ride a bike, his dad taught him how to ride a bike, and I will likely someday teach my own children. So a meme is a cultural idea, and this can be almost anything. And Dawkins argued that cultural ideas replicate in the same way that genes do in an imitating fashion. Monkey see, monkey do. And humans have a desire to belong, and what better way to belong than by doing what everyone else is doing, right? Though my mother always told me, if everyone was jumping off a bridge, then would you do it too? And the obvious prompted answer is no. <laughs> but for most things, yes, we jump off that metaphorical bridge, we imitate because we want to belong. If we journey even further back in time, we would see that other cultural ideas, like the controlled use of fire and the development of language, are memes, spread throughout cultures and repurposed for their unique, specific use. And it's this development and evolution of language that gives us phrases on the internet like, we stand a queen. Now, when I first saw this phrase, I actually had to text one of my friends and ask them what it meant, because, I mean, I knew it was English, but was it? This is an emphatic way to express your support for someone. It's positive stuff, but let's look at another. Let's get this bread. Now, the reality of you or I understanding this phrase, if you're not keeping up with these evolving conversational phrases on the internet, is probably slim to none. Now, this one's a bit easier to decipher. There's no varied spelling, slang, shortened words. And if you spend time with it in context long enough, you'd figure out that it's motivational and refers to the procurement of money. But that's the kicker. You have to spend time with internet memes in order to understand them. So now we've arrived to the present. If you say the word meme today, you're likely referring to the rapidly evolving and wildly popular internet memes. And just like that, the word meme became a meme, something repurposed and appropriated through time. It doesn't get more metalinguistic than this, I promise. So in 2013, Richard Dawkins revisited his original term meme to clarify that an internet meme is different than the meme that he once described. An internet meme is a meme or a cultural idea that's been deliberately altered by human creativity. So, via the internet and cyber culture, these things become digital artistic expressions. So let's take a look at what it takes and how people make these artistic masterpieces. Memes are essentially comics, but without a formal outlet like a newspaper. The first and most popular form of internet meme was image macros. 
And Grumpy Cat here is a great example. It's a caption superimposed on an image. Rather than putting your witty comment below a photo, you're putting it right on top. So though they've evolved, internet memes today generally follow this same format. But arguably, creating a successful meme today versus, say, six years ago requires more time, a thorough knowledge of current events, and even familiarity with complex design and editing software. So for instance, all of these things come together and you really need to be paying attention to what's happening both on the internet and outside of the internet in order to understand these memes. For instance, traditional schooling requires that students study classic novels as they appear in other forms of entertainment and even conversation. It makes people cultured. Knowledge of popular internet memes functions in the same way, especially among younger generations. And if you're not keeping up, it's really easy to fall behind. And clearly, I've been there. And then they make memes about that, too. <laughs> so if you don't get it, you're not in the loop. But why do you want to be in the loop? Who cares, right? Humans have a desire to be a part of something bigger than themselves. And the validation you receive on the internet from a meme well done is not a commentary on the way you look or the way you dress. Rather, it's a more personal level of validation of your cleverness, intellect, and worldly knowledge. And as an added bonus, maybe you'll leave something immortal behind. Another human desire that's oddly contrary to fitting in is to stand out, to leave a legacy, to be remembered. So I had a meme go a little bit viral once. STEM professors, no curve, no study guide, no mercy. Liberal arts professors, that test was too hard. Here's a picture of a unicorn. And now this was an actual email from one of my professors. And the play here is on a stigma amongst university students that liberal arts students do not work as hard or do not have as rigorous of a curriculum as our business or engineering peers. And as these themes regularly occur in the UT Memes Facebook page, I decided to post this. And so people were commenting, tagging, sharing this. And while all of these themes seem small, I was left feeling like I had accomplished something, even though in reality, I had accomplished nearly nothing. But that's how it goes. I mean, virality is pretty rare, unless you're Kylie Jenner, who is the world record, well, runner-up world record holder for the highest number of likes on Instagram behind <laughs> a picture of an egg. But that's how it goes. Compared to the number of people on this planet and the number of things posted per day, a very small number of things reach beyond your immediate followers. And unless you're Kylie Jenner, that following is at most a few hundred friends that might see your post. So in 2013, researchers at Indiana University conducted a study to see how internet memes go viral. Now, I hate to burst your bubble, but apparently what they found is that it's a result of complete random chance. Once an internet meme is shared beyond the first person that posts it, that exponentially increases its likelihood to be shared again by introducing it to a whole new crowd of followers, and therefore exponentially increasing its likelihood to go viral. On the other hand, if an internet meme does not get shared, it dies out quickly and everyone forgets it ever happened. In this way, internet memes function like a virus spreading like a contagion and dying out without a host. Hence the term virality. So armed with this awareness, anyone on the internet has the potential to become famous. Anyone can create a meme and maybe go viral and be virtually free of social consequences, especially if the joke that they make is a little bit offensive. Now on most platforms, there's no authorship attached. So why does it matter? Except on Facebook. Facebook has your name, your face, your friends, and usually your most sincere social brand. Not too long ago, recently accepted students to Harvard University formed a Facebook page in which they shared memes to build community before their arrival to campus. However, university officials caught wind of this group and rescinded 10 students' acceptances to the university upon the discovery of images mocking sexual assault, 
the Holocaust, and the deaths of children. Now, these examples mark extreme topics of taboo in American culture, and this, these are extreme examples of the social consequences of internet meme creation. But most of the time, no one faces any consequences. People feel freer to flirt with the boundaries of the taboo and create offensive memes for what psychology professor John Suler calls the online disinhibition effect. People behave differently online than they do in person. For what Professor Suler delineates in six key contributors, but I find four of these incredibly key to internet meme creation. The first of these, dissociative anonymity. The ability to hide your true identity online allows you to remove yourself from responsibilities of your actions. Additionally, there's invisibility, and that's a lack of physical contact with other users on the internet. Moreover, that lack of physical contact often leads to dissociative or dehumanizing behaviors of other online users. By not viewing people as actual people with real feelings, this often leads to the production of especially offensive internet memes via solipsistic interjection. And finally, the minimization of authority. The lack of an authoritative figure online feeds the production of especially offensive memes. And for now, there's no law against creating offensive memes. A law against creating any kind of meme would be encroaching on our freedom of speech. So all of these things come together, all of these behaviors forming the online disinhibition effect lead to controversial creations that call into question the boundary between free speech and socially disruptive behavior. But that's the point of jokes, right? To disrupt the audience's expectations. We often laugh because we're uncomfortable. Think of any successful comedian you've heard. Some of the bits that we react the most to are the ones that have us thinking in our head, did they just say that out loud? Or for instance, tickling. That's one of the most uncomfortable situations you can ever be in, and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. But we laugh. Or babies. Let's take a look at babies. They have no concept of language yet. So what they're laughing at is often very natural or innate. So if you're making a baby laugh, then you're probably genuinely funny. Or you're making them uncomfortable. <laughs> Think about what babies laugh at, right? Peekaboo. When you play peekaboo with a baby, they don't yet understand object permanence. They don't understand that when you cover your eyes, that you're still there. They think you've disappeared entirely. So when you suddenly reappear, they are shocked. And they usually laugh because they don't really know what else to do. <laughs> and that's kind of how we react to offensive memes. <laughs> so why do people make memes? Why does this all matter? To answer this question, I polled about 1,000 of my Facebook friends. And the results ultimately fell in these four categories for validation, to make fun of your friends, <laughs> to make a statement, political or otherwise, or start a conversation, or to laugh and distract from reality and daily life, often via some commonality. And while all of these goals are different, they seem to have one thing in common. They build relationships. And consequently, they build communities. They build communities in geographic areas, like states or universities, or cities. They build communities amongst people with similar interests, like music, or cats, or dogs, and so much more. And again, paying attention to these things that happen both within and outside of cyber culture is so key to understanding them. For instance, the kind of memes that you'll see on the UT memes page are often City of Austin happenings, university news, or the decades-long rivalry with Texas A&M. So all of these things come together to form cyber culture. All of these communities, all of these individuals connecting to form cyber culture, one culture in which we all participate. It's rather funny to me how something so inherently silly can have such a major effect on the way we communicate with one another. And not only is it connecting individuals and communities, it's connecting generations as well. I don't know about you guys, but my parents text me memes. 
And it's so interesting, I've heard generations older than myself or even older than my parents say that they're just writing off internet memes. They don't need to spend time with them and they don't need to understand them. They're silly internet jokes. But many people felt this way about other innovations in the past. The internet, Facebook, smartphones, and even paper. When paper as we know it today was gaining popularity, older generations wrote it off and said that tablet writing was much more permanent and respected and that paper was an innovation that wouldn't last. <laughs> Memes are no paper for now. But meme culture will only continue to grow and there's no stopping it. And it will continue to affect the way we communicate with one another in the future. Maybe someday, internet meme creation will be a skill essential to successful relationships or even the job market. Maybe it already is. But for now, keep scrolling, keep sharing. And as they say on Twitter, thank you for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs>